Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Well, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Dr. Mari Heider, who's going to do the second part of our series on the impact of torture on medical care. Dr. Heider is on the faculty here in the International Medicine Clinic and is a clinical instructor of medicine here at UW, and I will turn it over to her. Thanks, Brian. So um, I'm going to be speaking today about the impact of torture on medical care. This is the second part of a two-part series. Last week, my colleague Nicole Ehrenholtz um, discussed the legal definition of torture, introduced you to what different types of torture there are, and then also um, began to, to talk about the relevance um, to current issues in patient care. Today I'm going to continue by talking about how to use that information if you are to get a history of torture or trauma from a patient, and then what resources are available to you as a clinician, but also to your patients. I wanted to start briefly by addressing how to ask the question of getting a torture history and give some tips on that. Oftentimes in my patients in clinic, they're refugees or immigrants, so starting off by asking where they were born and what made them leave their country is a natural way to ask that question. Oftentimes people that leave their country are persecuted because of their political beliefs, their religious beliefs, or perhaps their tribe. And so asking whether they've ever been imprisoned because of those reasons can also um, lead to a history of torture. In areas where you're asking about trauma more generally but not torture, I find it helpful to take either symptoms from their history or findings in their physical exam. For instance, if you see a scar um, on physical exam, asking about the story behind the scar and trying to figure out whether it was purposely inflicted is helpful. In terms of the history, things um, that Nicole mentioned last year or last week, such as um, whether or not they have chronic pelvic pain, chronic headaches or insomnia can sometimes be a segue. For instance, asking somebody with chronic pelvic pain about whether they've had um, sexual um, abuse in the past, or asking somebody with insomnia whether they have chronic nightmares as the source of their insomnia can be a helpful way about eliciting a torture history. And then not, once you get the um, history of nightmares, it's oftentimes very helpful to ask what those nightmares are about and, and try to um, see whether there is a recurring theme or event that they might be re-experiencing. In terms of how to use the information, oftentimes I find it helpful to use the, um, a torture history in trying to work up or diagnose certain symptoms. So this is a chart from a paper published last year in JAMA on the care of non-English speaking patients who are victims of trauma or torture. As you can see, many of the symptoms that we've talked about, chronic pain, chronic headaches, um, dizziness, sexually transmitted infections, chronic pelvic pain, can often be related to um, or have some link to a past history of trauma. For one example that I have specifically, I see, uh, saw recently a patient, 60-year-old gentleman from Ethiopia, who was complaining of some burning on the soles of his feet. And I began to ask him questions that might help me diagnose um, some etiology for his peripheral neuropathy, and through that discussion realized that he had actually been imprisoned for four months in Ethiopia. And during that time, his ankles had been shackled and he had been repeatedly um, whipped on the bottom of his feet. A, type of torture called phalangia. And we discussed um, the relationship betwe between his symptoms occurring in that incident, and it seemed most likely that the etiology of his um, symptoms were related to that event. So we were able to discuss that likely um, the symptoms were related, and rather than go through a long kind of drawn out workup and um, recommendations for treatment, I was able to recommend some footwear, recommend some physical therapy for gait training, and get him um, get him some information about why he had those symptoms. The other way that we use this frequently is to anticipate and prevent future re-traumatization. Many of the things that we do in clinical medicine actually have parallels to different types of torture. You can see here a picture on the left of waterboarding and on the right of a patient getting a central line. Clearly, somebody who had had episodes of either asphyxiation, um, had, had their head covered, or waterboarding would have difficulty with this procedure in the future. I have a couple other examples of ways that um, medical care can sometimes parallel different episodes of trauma and torture. We've heard frequently from patients that have difficulties with MRIs, not just patients with torture or trauma, but many different types of patients have, have difficulty being in an enclosed space, but particularly for patients who have been either shackled or forced to be in positions for long periods of time or even detained in inhumane settings or closed spaces. Those patients will have a very difficult time in future um, episodes getting procedures such as this. And similarly, with patients who have had electrical torture in the past, the most obvious parallel is with um, EMGs, where many patients say that it's not only painful, but the um, 
that they've actually experienced exacerbation of their symptoms just with getting this diagnostic study. But even patients who have had ECGs or are just hooked up to wires, those patients can have reactivation of many of their symptoms or re-traumatization just simply by the act of being connected to these wires. So being thoughtful of, of um, that history when ordering these studies can be helpful. Asking patients to be NPO or um, focus on nutrition or diet or restrain for certain types of food is, is very common in clinical medicine. In many of the patients that we see as they get older, things like diabetes and hypertension and hyperlipidemia, we refer them to our nutritionist or we ourselves counsel them on restricting their food intake. We've had actually a few different patients who um, we've seen in our clinic, Cambodian patients who've lived through the Khmer Rouge, who um, we've advised to do some of these things. And after many episodes or many years sometimes of noncompliance or difficulty controlling these, these um, chronic illnesses, have discovered that they have had periods of um, chronic starvation. And this is related to not only forced starvation or deprivation, but also many of our refugees who have come from areas or refugee um, camps who have had food, that, um, food issues or food scarcity issues. So these patients may have a difficult time restraining um, from intake in the future to, to prevent or to um, help modify these chronic illnesses but also actually may have exacerbation of some of these chronic symptoms. The Cambod Cambodian patient I spoke of actually had um, pain in her feet, an area where she had been beaten while she was in Cambodia, and she, her body associated um, deprivation, food deprivation, and feeling hungry with pain in that specific part of her body. Other patients report an increase in episodes of nightmares or PTSD when asked to deprive food because their body so strongly affiliates that sensation of food deprivation with those symptoms. Um, this is actually an example on the left of a nursing facility and on the right of actually our detention facility in um, Tacoma. And this is just to illustrate an example of a patient that I had who, a uh, Vietnamese patient, uh, elderly patient who was in um, a re-education camp in Vietnam and actually was admitted not that long ago for uh, subclavian steel syndrome and recurrent falls. And the physical therapist team and the inpatient admitting team very strongly recommended that the patient go to a, to a rehab facility or physical therapy and, and he needed 24-hour supervision and the patient adamantly refused. What they didn't understand and what came out of the discussions with them about why he refused so strongly was that he had been in the re-education camps and had ex extreme PTSD from, from those episodes and that was the reason he was strongly, strongly against ever being in any sort of a, a facility ever again. So another way that we can use this patient, other than um, helping with the workup diagnosis and also helping prevent re-traumatization, is in giving control back to our patients. I know that many of us try to empower our patients every, in every interaction we have in clinic, but particularly with patients who have had that control taken away from them in an extreme way, who have been tortured or traumatized, um, having them control as much of their clinical care as possible is, can be helpful in improving compliance. So oftentimes, when, not only when I'm getting their history and doing their exam, but also when we're talking about the timing of certain workup or labs, we'll ask the patient how fast we should go in those things. So in asking questions, I will oftentimes let them know that they're able to stop answering at any time or leave the room or take a break. Um, whenever I'm doing an exam, especially if I'm doing um, an exam that's in a sensitive area, I will ask their permission and, and let them know that they're able to stop at any time. And then in some of the procedures that I mentioned above, whether you're working chronic headaches and doing an imaging study of the brain, or whether you're working up neuropathy and getting an EMG study, it's helpful to let the patient know that, um, if, if possible, that you can delay those procedures and, and give them a chance to do it on their own pace. Similarly, letting them know that you're not forcing them to take these medications, but that it's a choice can be helpful um, in actually improving compliance, we found, or at least improving their ability to freely admit to you when they're not taking their medications. So Dr. Inholtz showed you last week a couple of um, self-portraits that different patients had drawn um, about their bodies, and this is one example here of a self-portrait. But one way that we've found having this history useful is actually being able to um, link the patient's symptoms with their past history of torture. The Ethiopian gentleman, for instance, that I mentioned, actually didn't connect the pain in his feet to that episode of beatings that he'd had. So certain things that may seem fairly obvious to us, oftentimes patients won't make that connection. And we found that um, giving them a sense of prognosis in the long term and saying that their symptoms may wax and wane, particularly with future events, 
sometimes a, um, a cancer diagnosis or a significant um, stress later on in life can actually re-exacerbate re symptoms of PTSD or re-exacerbate symptoms of chronic pain, and explaining that that might not be related to medications not working, but rather that um, the stress in their life, their life events are intricately related to the symptoms that they're having, and um, they may experience um, recurrence of these symptoms. Lastly, I just want to mention briefly a couple of resources for you as clinicians, but also for your patients. The Northwest Health and Human Rights Project is a collaboration that's here at Harborview um, and is also at the International Counseling and Community Services down in Tacoma and the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project that's based in Seattle. It's a collaboration between a medical, a mental health, and a legal organization who provide, we all provide comprehensive care to torture victims. Um, here at the medical branch, we do two specific things. One is for patients who aren't plugged in with primary care and who have a history of torture, we will do a medical evaluation and um, have time. We oftentimes will have up to 90 minutes for these visits to get their full torture history, make a connection between any of the symptoms that they're having now and their torture history, make further recommendations for workup, and also try to plug them into primary care. The second thing that we do here at the International Clinic is um, do medical evaluations for asylum seekers. I just want to talk briefly about that. As many of you are already um, huge advocates for your patients, one way in which to use a torture history to advocate for your patients is for patients who are undocumented. Um, patients who are undocumented who have a history of torture may meet eligibility criteria to have um, a green card or to g gain asylum from the U.S. And this is immensely helpful for patients who um, are undocumented but also don't have um, any access to medical care or medical insurance. So we have found that um, in many of our patients who are chronically ill, if they do have an undocumented history, I actually will screen them for a history of torture as a way to advocate for them and plug them in for legal counsel. Just to comment on this, um, you as the primary, if you are the primary care physician, should not be the one to do their medical asylum evaluation because of a conflict of interest. They should be referred usually to one of these organizations, Health Right International or Physicians for Human Rights, who can do a medical evaluation, a medical affidavit, and submit that um, as part of their case so that when the uh, judge sees their case, we'll also have that information. If you yourself are interested in learning how to do these asylum medical evaluations, the same organizations provide training and a volunteer network where you can um, volunteer your time to do that. So I just wanted to come back briefly to our case that we talked about um, last week, a 48-year-old Oromo-speaking woman with a history of torture and HIV who came with symptoms of insomnia, fatigue, headaches, and chronic pain. This patient actually um, was undocumented, who we, we uncovered was undocumented. Because of her history of female genital mutilation, there's actually a case law out there that patients who have this in the past are eligible for asylum. So we were able to refer her for legal counsel, um, have her file an asylum application, which is actually once you file an asylum application, you are Medicaid eligible and eligible for, for, um, for health insurance. We were able to ask her through kind of a patient-centered model what her main um, symptom was that she was concerned about, and her, and her main symptom that she was concerned about was the sleep and insomnia. Underlying that insomnia were chronic um, nightmares, and so treating those nightmares was one way for us to establish rapport and get her engaged in care. So just to summarize, um, torture is prevalent around the world. Many people have experienced it, unfortunately, but also more generally, I think trauma is, is prevalent, and in many of our patients, um, asking about a history of trauma is, is just as relevant as torture, because even if they don't meet the legal definition, they may have many of the symptoms, and you may be able to um, care for them and think and consider some of these things in the same way. Knowing history of torture and trauma can also help explain some of the chronic physical and psychiatric symptoms that um, we see in clinic and sometimes make it challenging to care for patients. And so having that history can help further their care. We can use it as clinicians to prevent re-traumatization, and we can also use it to help advocate for our patients, particularly those who are undocumented.